Okay, hey, let's turn in our Bibles to Psalm 16 tonight. <clears throat> and we're going to uh, we're going to talk about the body of Christ of whom we are. Psalm 16 and I want us to think about this idea of serving the Lord. And often one could say, I think we all would say, that, that we want to serve, <coughs> serve the Lord. <coughs> Pardon me. But how we go about that and the reading that you had in your, in your textbook talked about the church of Jesus Christ and, and uh, it was, you know, it was a very good reading, but I want to, I want to look at the, the practical reality that God has for every single believer who's been baptized into the body of Jesus Christ and pertaining to the second question about discerning, what does it mean to discern the body? Because obviously, if one does not properly discern the body, there are issues. And as those portions bring out. But what, what do you think it would mean, practically speaking, as a New Testament believer to, to serve God? Well, Psalm 16 brings out a very interesting point, and uh, we're going to begin there, pertaining to it. And in verse 3, Psalm 16, <clears throat> it says, but, well, verse 2. O oh, my soul, thou hast said unto the Lord, You are my Lord. My goodness extends not to you, but to the saints that are in the earth, and the excellent in whom is all my delight. So here, here the psalmist is saying, God, I want to serve you and I am going to serve you, but the practical side of serving God really is serving his people. Really, it is having a relationship, a spiritual relationship with God's people. And who are these people? And why should it be that I, I would focus my attention in dealing with them? Well, it's not that I, um, well, it's not that I'm occupied with people. I'm occupied with Christ. But then what I am occupied with now is extending to the body of Christ. And we're talking about really body life, not just being an assembly, not being uh, in one, you know, in, in, in a building somewhere or doing some uh, Christian activity. We're, we're talking about the ongoing continual relationships that function within God's body that is so vital and it makes a big difference in terms of, in terms of our own personal life. In John chapter 15, verse 13, Jesus said this, and uh, he said, no greater love hath a man than this, but that he what? All right. That he lays down 
his life. How many times can you do that? Who said that? Thank you. As many times as it takes, because I got to understand that the laying down, well, let me put it this way, once for all in my mental attitude, but at any point in time when it's necessary, okay? In other words, I, make, I have a premeditated decision that I perceive, I discern the body of Christ as my friends, all right? Thus, I'm available. And basically, that's, you know, I'm available for what? No, I'm available. Yes, I understand, but, uh, you know, available for what? I'm available. And I don't necessarily define it according to conditions or circumstances. And this is where true volunteerism, I'm making up that word, but truly where people are, are free to lay their life down. They're free to do so, okay? Now I remember, uh, this was some decades ago, but in any case, it was, uh, it was a, a, a group of 10 pastors in an area in New Jersey, and they, uh, they, got, they got together, we had lunch together and everything, and, and the discussion went to uh, this, this was the direction of the discussion. Where did the volunteers go? Now, this, is, this was a good 20 years ago, this conversation. These were pastors who had been in their pulpit no less than 10 years. They were in churches that had been in the community no less than 50 years. These were what we would call established family, denominational churches, second generation, whatever you want to call it. But in any case, the thing that they were now confronted with uh, in leadership was that there were no volunteers. And now that they, you know, were taking this on, so now they found themselves having to have to go outside to hire a song leader, musicians, a choir director, okay, and uh, maintenance. And it was, a real, it was a real issue because it wasn't always like that. They remembered when it wasn't like that, when people were, you know, people would lay their life down and, uh, and, and you know, it's no problem. But now they're confronted with this, this issue that they can't get people, and maybe they would say to participate or to volunteer, to help, okay? And, and it was a great dilemma. Because if you can imagine what it would be like to have to go out and hire, okay, and, and some ministries have to do that. But it's crazy because, you know, how do you hire a song leader? That person, that person has to have the heartbeat of that pastor or he is, they will butt heads. They, they will not compliment each other. And just to fill in the, the, the idea that, you know, we can get a group of people singing the songs that we, that we sing is not song leading. Pastor TJ is a gift. He is. <laughs> and I've seen enough of the other stuff to just know that that is amazing blessing. Amazing blessing. And so it should be that we, we're going to see something here. Because if I really discern the body of Jesus Christ, if I really know who you are, and likewise who I am to who you are, and vice versa, then we can have some amazing, powerful, effective, dynamic, and significant relationships. 
I was thinking of this. To, to know the Lord is to serve him. I want you to think of this just for a minute. The more I get to know Jesus Christ, the more I, I have a desire to want to serve him. But that doesn't mean that I want to accelerate my time to go to heaven. <laughs> you know, like then I'll, I'll serve him. No. It means that I begin to see the many varied ways for which I, with his body, of whom he is the head, by serving his body, I'm serving the head. That's the principle. By serving the body, I'm serving the head. And woe unto the man who says, I, I love God, but I can't stand these people. And the Word of God has something very precise to say about, about that. But to know God is to want to serve him. And then, and then I... I, I find I find the body of Christ operationally, okay? So yes, we understand that there's the universal body of Jesus Christ made up of every single believer and every single generation making up the church age and, and all of us will be there redeemed in heaven, uh, you know, Bema Seat Awards, all of that's gonna take place. That's the universal body of Christ. Then we have the manifestation of that reality in a local assembly. A local assembly. And the whole premise of a table of organization where the gift of the pastor teacher and the evangelist, and from that comes now the fulfillment of two of Jesus Christ's, the, the parting requirements before going to heaven. Number one, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy mind, all thy strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. The love that we are to show God is going to be the love that we show to each other. Then the second thing that Jesus said, Matthew 28, go into all the world. The great commission will be fulfilled not by an organization, but by a local assembly, local assemblies, okay? Um, we live in a very unique um, Era. I was I was uh, directed to a, a church, a church in Singapore, and they have uh, they have an amazing ministry. By the way, you know what I, I like to do if I go if I go to visit uh, you know another church or someplace or if I'm invited to speak in there, I always like to find out <clears throat> and I'll, I'll look for pictures on the wall. You know, because we have pictures on the wall, but I look for pictures on the wall. Like, who has left this assembly and gone out? Who has been sent from this local church? You know, not from some denominational board or or some. Uh, you know, mission organization, but I mean, literally from that church, these families, they grew up and they, you know, got a vision and, and the church got behind them and sent them out, okay? That is the biblical model for evangelism. But this church in Singapore has uh, mobilized their young people. I wouldn't say mobilized. I mean, God, God's got down into their, their young people like nobody's business, and it's awesome. It really is. Their young people compose the music that they worship with. I mean, it's just like they compose this music with the lyrics and, and everything, and, and they, they sing them. Um, and their young people, I believe, I mean, I don't believe it because it's already happening, 
but they have a vision to send missionaries to where? Here. Oh yeah, and they speak English. Pretty interesting. I thought of that and I said, you know what? I said, here we are. Now, you know, as a client nation, I mean, and, and we, could, we could measure, we could see, you know, the, the 150 plus years and when missionaries were going from this country, being sent from America and going into all the world and making an impact. And then how that through attrition and pressure and issues and, and problems, you know, the, the numbers began to dwindle and, and, and that, that rushing river turned into a trickle. And so it is today. There are more Christians in America than perhaps in anywhere else, but there are less missionaries going from America. Okay? And so, God's going to raise up, you know, others and equip them. And he's going to send them. And so, it's very interesting, this kind of truth. So, here, here's something I want us to see. Uh, we, are, we are, like when it says that no greater love but to lay your life down for your friends. We are, we are friends who act like servants. We are friends and we just act like servants. I'm looking for the privilege of serving you. You are looking for the privilege of serving another. You, you see the connection that, that in, in serving God, I serve his people. See? If I were to say, God, I, I give my life to you, he says, good, I'm going to give you to my life in the body. And that's what people have discovered here, is that, that more and more, the, the clarity of what God wants to do in my life is forged in the relationships that I have in the body. See, it wouldn't be that you could just come here and get Bible knowledge and you know, classroom time and, 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 and that sort of thing, and, and, and in a way be some kind of way disconnected to the ebb and flow of the life of the body. If that were the case, then you know, it, it just, it, we would miss the real purpose for why this Bible school is even in existence. Okay. So, discerning the body of Christ. Well, in John 15, 14, let's just take a look at that. John chapter 15. There's some good things here. He says in 13 that uh, this love, <clears throat> this love will lay, its, lay down its life for its friends. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Now, uh, in 1 John 5, 3, we read that the commandments of God are not grievous. You know where a lot of grief comes from in people's lives? Is that <clears throat> they tend to want to think that the commandments are a restriction. That there's some restriction that's now coming. God is, God is going to give me some commandments. But you know what he says? He says it right here in... <clears throat> in uh, Fifteen of, of uh, John 15, Henceforth I call you not my servants, for the servant know not what his Lord does, but I have called you friends for all things I have heard of my Father. I have made known unto you. 
That's, that's, a, that's an amazing intimacy that Jesus Christ would have with each of us revealing what he knows of the Father. See, what he is sharing from the Father, he says, I will now share that with you. And, and then notice 17. These things I command you that you what? You love one another. Now, is that a grievous commandment? Well, it could be. <clears throat> it could be if there weren't three things that I want us to see related to this thing called love. And this will help us to define in our thinking what it means to really love according to the Word of God. So he says it in verse 12 of John 15, this is my commandment that you love one another. Now if I stopped right there, I'd do injustice to the verse. As I have loved you. See, the premise is, I need to first be loved before I even think I got any kind of love for you. <laughs> and if I understand that the first love for me is unconditional. I'm always amazed about, and, and you know, there will be situations that God will engineer where you, you, you have to receive from someone else, you are dependent on someone else, you can't do it on your own, and how, how you receive that will make a huge difference in, in your life. There are some people that just, they, they, they're, they're givers, but they're not receivers. They're givers, oh yes, uh, you know, call me anytime, I, you know. And, and that that's, it seems so great. Turn those tables around and you find a resistor. You find what comes out of them is this, this pride. But that pride was there when they were giving too. See? And so now the circumstances are, are turned and they now must receive. They must be ministered to. They must welcome what is to be given to them. Because if it's coming from the body, it's coming from Jesus Christ. And it's amazing that, and, and, and this is where things can get grievous. <laughs> because pride gets in there. But as I have loved you, is the real definition for this kind of love. That I have for the body is the love that I am receiving from Jesus Christ. And that's amazing, because it is unconditional. And it's transforming. And then I want you to think of this. In Romans chapter 12, verse 10, this kind of love that we're to have for each other contains an amazing ingredient it contains honor. He says, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. In honor, preferring one another. What does it mean to honor someone? Well, the word there in the Greek, taime, it means to put a proper estimation of value on something. To honor something is to put a proper estimation of value. What is its true value? Okay. And the true value of you has nothing to do with me. 
Not how I, va- not how I put it on, but I, I say, you know, how should I look at, the, at the, the most uncomely person in the body, whoever that might be? The, the, the weakest person in the local assembly, whoever that might be. Could be the pastor. The, 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 the neediest person in any local assembly, whoever that might be, okay, what could I say is the, is the proper estimate of value? Well, that is, is that that person is whom Jesus Christ died for. There's the measurement. Not because they're uh, efficient, not because they are useful, not because they are talented, not because they are helpful, friendly, my kind of people. Not, none of that. <laughs> none of that. I mean, that could be true and that could come, but, but first and foremost, before they, before they do anything, they are someone to him. And he is that measure of value. And who am I? Oh my gosh. Who am I to say, that's not important. Well, that's not discerning the body of Christ. That's not discerning the true measure of value of the weakest one, the frailest one, the one that just failed and got back up. That's how I need to think about that. Honor, it's amazing. Second thing that can make these, the commandment to love easier, less grievous, it's found in Luke chapter 17 and verse 3 has to do with forgiveness. Oh boy. Forgiveness. And what Jesus says you know, he always, you know, he had many, many opportunities. Now, he would go and teach in the temple every day. And on the Sabbath in the synagogue. And then outdoors in a boat. I mean, if we were to think about it, but the teaching ministry of Jesus Christ was relentless. It was like perpetual. It was like, even, you know, they would say, he is beside himself. He is like, man, you're just too much, Lord. (laughs) So he's teaching here. And he says, take heed to yourselves. If your brother trespass against you, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. Now, let me ask the question. Is that a conditional Verse. Is that teaching conditional forgiveness? If it's teaching conditional forgiveness, what are the conditions? Okay. I think that to understand it, actually, the the correct question is that it's it's not conditional. It's not conditional because before one person repents, I am to forgive them mentally. But look look at this word, rebuke. Rebuke. Now, a lot of people like this word because they like to think that that means I'm going to straighten them out. But the word here in the Greek means to, to rightfully charge, to rightfully charge. Okay, so, person has offended you. To rightfully charge means 
that I now assign the responsibility to that person. What am I saying? All too often, person A offends person B. Person B does not go to person A. Person B goes to person C, D, E, F, G, right down to Z, telling them what happened to, between them and A. They didn't assign the offense to the right person. Somebody gets upset at work or angry, they come home and, you know, with the wife or the children or in the, that they become the target, see? But rightfully assigning them. Now, this is something that is so important because the Bible says, I have a right to go to that person alone first <coughs> off. If it's not first off, I'm off. First off. Somebody would come up and say, you know what? <clears throat> I got to tell you something about Tyree. I said, I, I said, is, is he here? Well, no, 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 no. I, 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 okay, I'll tell you what. Let's just take a few minutes and let's get him here in the conversation. I guarantee you that'll do one of two things. Either it'll end the conversation right there and everybody wants to go home because they don't want to talk about it or it becomes the grounds for reconciliation. But if I were to sit there and just listen to what this guy has to say to me about Tyree, and I'm not even a first-hand witness to what happened there, I am now completely disqualified in helping them at, at, in the least bit. In fact, I am now guilty of violating the integrity of the body by hearing an accusation against another body member whom Christ died for. But I got set up in the situation, now being forced to become a judge. And if I could say, my gosh, this happens too often. Way too often. Why? Because we don't we don't assign it to the right person. That's what's in this verse here that Jesus is saying. You know, the, the rebuke is not like, uh, you know, getting in somebody's face and, you know, I, I don't like the way you're doing this. No, no, no. It's like, okay, you are, you are the target for now the next thing that needs to happen. And that is repentance. Repentance. But repentance will meet forgiveness, not probation. Um, if you've ever known anybody that's been on probation, when, do, when does that get assigned to them? Yes, and? Well, no, not after they've been punished. Yes, okay, right. They have to go through the entire judicial process to the end and, and yet found guilty. And the judge says, I, I could give you two, two to five, but I'm going to let you out on what? Probation. Probation. All right, now. That means he's still guilty, right? Been charged, verdict, and now he's on probation. If I've ever put someone on probation, meaning like, if I say, uh, I, I forgive you, but I, I won't forget. Oh. What you're really saying is that you've already judged that person. You've already come to a conclusion and you are going to interact with them on that basis. Even though you said the words forgive, <laughs> the words forgive have not been the kind of forgiving words that Jesus has said to you. See, here comes that love again. How was I loved? Well, Jesus didn't say, you know, okay, I died for your sins, but I got my eye on you. 
<laughs> and I mean like one, one little glimmer and I think you're going back. Oh, yes. I remember. So forgiveness is like divine. It's divine. It's divine. It's not human. It's not human. Never let anybody get away with the idea that they could forgive and not forget like as if that they are going to wait for some performance factor. Well, I think you really mean it now. I think you really got your life together now. Oh, really? Is that right? That's good. Huh. I didn't know I was still on the stage of guilt. But that's what it is. And people just kind of like accept that. You know what they say? They say, but I am a human being. Yes, you are. And God is not saying, try to forget, try to forget, try to forget, try to forget. Don't, you know, don't, don't think about it. No, he's just saying, just take my thoughts. Receive my thinking about that person. And most of all, receive my thinking about you. Because if you receive what I think about you and you think those thoughts about them, then you'll find that those thoughts do not carry guilt or condemnation or probation. And then I'm free. Because it's supernatural. Somebody cited the fact that uh, those uh, precious Amish families and that guy that went through the school killed the children and then the headlines read Amish families forgive uh, gunmen you say like whoa what's whoa wow really well yeah they, but they didn't just say we forgive you and we're moving out of town you know what they did? They took his kids. They took his kids and said, like, we'll take care of your children because this is destroyed more than our families. See? That's laying your life, laying your life down. See, and that kind of love devastates the moral man. This is why we're talking about this. See, morality couldn't touch that. Morality say, give us justice. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Okay, you did that. We're going to put you in the chair and cook you, and then that ought, that ought to satisfy everybody, right? And everybody goes home happy? <laughs> Not hardly. So, amazing, this thing of forgiveness. It's very real. Because it's very God. <laughs> Think of this. Peter came to him. Matthew 18, 21. How oft shall I, my brother, sin against me and I forgive him? And Peter just kind of like throws this number out, but he doesn't really just throw this number out. See, he, he's a good Jewish boy, so he knows that <clears throat> in Jewish law, once shame on me, twice shame on you. If you do something two times, I am not obligated. I can, I can mentally, in whatever other kind of way, I can write you off. I don't, I don't have to deal with you, okay? Well, three times would be just amazing. So he, he just kind of took it and said seven times, thinking, wow, you could just wrap up about anything you want to in, in seven times of forgiveness, you know? I mean, that's once a week. That's one time each day. So Jesus said, of course, not seven times, but 70 times seven which is an Indian speech, which really means every time. Every time. Somebody told me, said, you know what, I don't have that kind of patience. I said, I know you don't. Neither do I. But I know the one who does. And so do you. So, which would you prefer? Your standard, if you live under your standard, 
you'll end up condemning yourself. <laughs> if you live under God's standard, then you'll have life. Life more abundantly in John 10.10. 10. See, this is, this is the power of the body of Christ because in the body is the manifestation of the life of the head, the thinking of God's mind, the way God views something, sees something, and then acts. And so every time there's forgiveness, does that mean that there's license to do wrong? No. You know why? Because I don't sin against the law. I sin against the person. I mean, if, if, it, if it were that I could just keep, you know, I could just kick this, this podium as long as I want to, okay? And, uh, and it's just no big deal, okay? Because it's not, it's not, it's not going to respond. But with people, human beings. And then I back it up and I say, who do you belong to? Not me. In fact, you don't even belong to yourself. But you belong to Jesus Christ. And now to touch you is to touch Christ. To deal with you is the way I deal with God. And I really need to get that straightened in my thinking. That's what it means to discern the body of Christ in an amazing way. So I honor, I put a proper value on someone and I rebuke, I put the right charge to the offender and no one else. And then the third thing here, and this is so good. I'm to pray for you. Paul puts it like this in Romans 15, 30. He says, now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. What do you think this means to pray for someone? Now, I'm not, gonna make, I'm not making a play on words here or... But what, what is Paul saying here? Strive together in your prayers for me. And we don't get any indication of any kind of prayer lists that Paul would put into their hands. I, I, you know, we, we need this and, and uh, you know, I, I would like that or, uh, I, you know, I, I have a sickness and, I want you to pray for my sickness. I mean, and, and there's not, not, not anything wrong with those things. Praying for versus praying with. When I pray with someone, I'm praying about their issues, their difficulties, their problems, the things that they are facing. And we can agree together in prayer. That's praying with them, but praying for them is seeing them in their call and in their purpose in Christ Jesus. So, I will pray for them. I will pray for their spiritual advancement. I will pray that they will finish their course. And I want you to think of this because um, Charles Spurgeon was one of the great preachers, Prince of Preachers, he was called. And uh, they'd fill up the tabernacle, and you know what they would say? They would, they would ask 
the members to not come to service so that visitors could get in. Place sat close to 6,000. And a visitor came one time and said, uh, said, this is amazing. Like, you know, half his congregation's not here, <laughs> and the place is packed. What is the secret to his preaching? And the fellow said, well, come on, follow me. And he went downstairs into the basement of the church, and he opened up the doors, and here were 400 people praying while Mr. Spurgeon was preaching. And he said, that's the secret right there. See? Praying that God would use that man and people would get saved and God would use him, not me. See, I want you to see, like, sometimes we would think, I would, I would be more effective if I prayed for me. No, you'll be plenty effective but get others to pray for you. That's what Paul is asking for here. It's amazing, from his apostolic office, he's saying, you know what? I need you to pray for me. It, this is not going to happen because of me. It's going to happen because you're praying for me. And I just want to think, you know, think of it. It's very unlikely that I will have ill will in my mind if I'm praying for you like that. In fact, I think it's impossible. Now, I could pray, and, and my expectation is that you'll prosper, that you'll come to maturity, that you'll advance, that uh, you'll just have an amazing impact. And the reason I think that this is so good is because it forces me to look beyond a person's faults, their weaknesses, their shortcomings, because I'm not going to expect that to hinder the work of God if I'm praying for them. See. Yeah, they got some shortcomings, they got some weaknesses, they got some frailties. Yes, don't we all? But, but you know, we have access to God who can change, overrule all that. Just overrule that if we ask. D.L. Moody, they used to make fun of him because he, he just, you know, didn't have good vocabulary, didn't, you know, speak very well. But who cared? People would come in, come in to sit down, and almost before they could get in their seat, they're weeping. Why? Same thing. So you want to know the secret? Moody did the same thing Spurgeon did. See, these guys all, they, you know, we, we read their sermons and we're amazed, you know, and they're done, you know, they're gone home and been with the Lord, you know, it's amazing what God did with them and everything like that. But you know what it really is? It's like they the body of Christ, see? And they were praying for these men. And so, wh whose success got, got <coughs> rewarded in heaven? Well, oh, Mr. Spurgeon, winning a million souls, congratulations, thank you very much. No, 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 no. He would be the first one to tell you, is, it, not me, no, 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 these people, these folks, they are the ones, see? They are the ones. And it's so Amazing for us to discern that, to see it. Because it then means that, like for instance, um, I, I forget who was saying that, but you know, so for everybody that's going to, to the European conference, you know, and I know that there's going to be, I mean, there's going to be some tremendous needs there, phenomenal needs, okay? And you know, but I, I'm, I'm not there, I'm here. Oh, no, 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 no. Whoa. I'll pray 
that God will use you that are going in, in an unbelievable way. See? That something out of you will impact somebody that's there, but I'm here, we're here, we're praying for you, go. Power, boom. It's, it, that's how that works. And it's got to be both. <laughs> You know, we didn't pick out four or five gifted people. We're going to send the gifted ones over there, you know? Yeah, that, no. It's like those, that, you know, you can barely scrape up the money that you got to go, and you're going to probably be bumming some meals over there while you're there, too. <laughs> but whatever the case may be, it's going to be an amazing, powerful time because of what we're talking about right now. And as we discern that, see, then, well... We're not going to be judgmental. We're not going to be critical. We're not going to be comparing ourselves and analyzing ourselves and being occupied with ourselves. <laughs> but we'll function in the privilege of laying our lives down for whatever. See, whatever. There's no qualification on that. And then the volunteerism thing gets solved. I'll close with this thought. You know, this Bible school, and uh, we had another pastor who ended up sending his son here. This was decades ago again. <laughs> but anyway, he said, he, said, he said, I can't believe you're graduates. And we said, what do you mean? He said, well, I had, I had a couple graduates come from the Bible college that I graduated from. And uh, they came to my church, and you know we're in, we were in the same denomination, and so they had a right to come to my church. And we, we sat down, some young, gifted men, and, and, and we started talking about what they maybe could do around the church and you know, help with that thing. But the conversation quickly got off of what they could do and got on to what they could get. And this was a seasoned man of God talking this way. And, and, and you could see in his eyes, he was like very like annoyed by that. He said they were telling me what time that they, you know, they should come in in the morning and, and uh, you know, uh, how much time, you know, would it, you get a break of lunch and, and whatnot. And I mean, you know what, like this conversation went south quick. And wh how did that happen? Why did that happen? He said, I couldn't figure it out. They were, they were Bible school graduates, and, and they were supposedly to come to serve. And he said, then two of your graduates showed up, <laughs> and they got there before I got to my office. I know so, because it had snowed that night, and, and, and they, I, I, I pulled up into the drive, and they were shoveling the snow off of the sidewalk going up to my office. And right then and there, I said, this is, a, this is different. This is different. And they sat down and, and they said, uh, Pastor so-and-so, what would you like for us to do? And he said, like, wow. It's a different story. Discerning the body. Learning this kind of love. Receiving it first for myself. But my goodness doesn't extend to you, oh God, as some abstract you know, entity in heaven. It, it is very tangible because it's now going to extend to the saints that are in the earth. The, 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 the flesh and bone of the body of Jesus Christ, right here, right now. And that is the thing that cultivates the kind of love. They said, they will know you. They, who, those folks, unbelievers, will know you by the way you love one another. Huh. 
not by, you know, how much time you spend with each other or the fact that you hang out a lot together like that, but no, the, the manner in which you love, you love with an unconditional love, you, you love with a capacity of forgiveness that, that forgets. It can't remember. Call it spiritual amnesia. But it's like I can see, you know, the Holy Spirit is the one that brings to remembrance those things which Jesus has said. And so now I look at a person and I don't remember that they offended me seven minutes ago because I forgave them. End of line. Because if it's anything else, I'm keeping score. And that's twice, that's three times. See, aren't you glad that Jesus don't know how to play baseball? <laughs> three strikes out. And you know what? There was, there, was a, there was a big movement back in the, in the early 80s. And... Uh, <laughs> This guy was on radio and television, and, and you know, I mean, he, he, he's okay, you know, but he built his ministry on the, the premise of this statement, the God of the second chance. The God of the second chance, you know, and, and he made his pitch and his appeal to people who had blown it, but they're gonna, God's gonna give them a second chance. I said, man, I blew by that when the, you know, 10 minutes in my Christianity. Oh my gosh, second chance. I'll do better this time, Jesus. I found out I didn't. And under that premise, sorry, next. And you know, and, and you think about this because, <laughs> and I mean, oh, it's some popular thing like, you know, that God would really give me a second chance, you know. But when I came in contact with the body of Christ, you, 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 know what I, you know what I saw right off the bat? I don't know. I mean, it, it wasn't anything brilliant on my part. I just kind of looked around, you know. And I said, you know what? There's something interesting about these people. What is it? They really are forgiven. They are forgiven people. And you know what? It doesn't matter what it was that they were forgiven of. They're living in the results of being forgiven. And I suddenly realized, you know what? I, I'm not even there. I'm still on the old school thing, you know, like, you know, forgive and then, you know, just kind of like, you know, be careful. Keep your eye out, you know, like you, you could get hurt again. You know what's interesting about getting hurt in life? It's like, it's like the amusement park ride of, of getting in on the bumper cars. How many know what I'm talking about? You know the bumper cars, okay? Now, what is, what is the objective of the bumper cars? Yeah, okay. I mean, you're going to get bumped. Now, if you don't want to get bumped, then don't get on that. You know, just don't get there. But I, I remember this one guy, and he... He thought it was the idea was to not get bumped. So he drove that thing and he was he was running from everything. You know, he's ducking here and he's ducking there and he's like, you know, it's like <laughs> And I said, hey, you know, like that's that's no what are you doing? Turn that thing around, bump on somebody, <laughs> you know? And uh you know, like if life didn't have this kind of engagement, I mean, we would be bored, quite frankly. We would, I mean, there would be no exercising of our capacity and, 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 our, and what, knowing what we have need of from God from moment to moment. And you know what? I don't, don't think that just because, you know, you show up to be needy means that you <laughs> have failed. If I show up in a situation and I've come short, and I'm needy, well, listen, God bless it. I know where the source is. It wasn't me. <laughs> it's Christ. And I can become an able minister of the grace of God 
because you know what? That's what people need to have from me to you and from you to me. That's why when we get around the body, it's not anything that we say that's edifying. It's the fact that we are together. That's edifying right there because I'm receiving something from you. So these are the things that make up body life. You know, the church, the church. And I would say this, that in, in any denomination, any local assembly, any group of believers, you have, you have um, those who are saved and born again are going to heaven and, and everything is fine. But then you have those who discern the body within that group. And I just kind of think we just got a little bit, you know, we, we got a lot of y'all. Y'all kind of gravitated here, and you know, and you're here now, and you, you know, you see it for what it is, and you're walking in it, and you're discovering it, and you're growing in it, and it's an amazing thing because you realize it's not based upon personality and human, you know, human attributes. It's supernatural. It's supernatural. I always love it that you know, from time to time, I'll just tell our, our dear folks up in Abbey Grace. I said, just stand up. I said, just turn around and look at these folks. Look at these folks. Like, you wouldn't, you know, in a New York minute, spend any time with these folks if you were in the natural. You wouldn't want to be around these folks. Not, mm -mm. But here you are. Not only just around them, you love them. How did that happen? <laughs> and I said, that's it. It's supernatural. And, in, and, and when someone comes in and visits, you know what they say? They usually say, I mean, they say it here too, but they say, I feel at peace here. So what do you mean you feel at peace? Well, no one is, I don't know, maybe, maybe no one's judging you mentally. Maybe no one is Avoiding you on the base, you know, and, 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 you know, they just said, boy, the people are so loving here. Well, you know what, it, it, you know, we all kind of know when it's contrived, okay? We all know what that's all about. But when you, when, you know, after the 54th person just really, you know, genuinely, like, is concerned and cares and loves you, you kind of say, like, this is, this is different. <laughs> you know, it's not like you have the... The, uh, the personality types at the door. Hi, how are you? So glad that you're here. God bless you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know. But when it's, when it's God <laughs> and, when, and when we understand who we are. And you know the other thing is, is that as we grow in grace and knowledge of who and what we are in Christ Jesus, we are learning how to be very relaxed people. We're just relaxed. And that means I don't have to prove anything. I don't, I don't you know, I don't, I don't have to, you know, I don't have to be somebody to be somebody. You know, who are you? Oh, well, uh, let me tell you, glad you asked. <laughs> I don't have to be anybody. And where else would you ever get that? You won't get that in the world. You won't get that even in, 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 in some households. But, but you, you get this in the body of Christ. And so now that is the kind of environment that is necessary for us to grow and be healthy people. See? And then when we're healthy, we're free. And when we're free, we're available. So God, you know, here am I. Here am I. You can send me. I'm not, gonna go, I'm not even going to go on my own. See? I don't wake up one day and just say, you know, I think, uh, I, think I, I got a call to Hawaii. I'm going. Got my plane ticket and everything like that. Well, no, 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 no. I just could stay put until I am what? Sent. Sent. Why? Because that means that there are those who are praying for me. 
And whether it's back down in Puerto Rico, you know what I mean? It's like, it's going to be like, yeah, these people, the, the body of Christ is praying for me. And, and that just emboldens me. That makes me very radical in my thinking. Because I'm sent. I didn't come on my own authority. But I'm sent on the authority of another. <laughs> and that's Jesus Christ. So, I think of this because many of us are are very much, you know, experiencing this. And, and in a way, uh, the church in Corinth had many, many problems. But you, you, you notice that the problems that they had uh, was not with the Rome. The problem that they had was not with, uh, uh, you know, political issues. The problem that they had was that they didn't discern who they were. They didn't see who they were. So some were of Apollos, they clicked off with him. Some were of Cephas, they clicked off with him. Then the real spiritual ones said, we are of Christ. <laughs> you know, like we are Jesus only. And they clicked off. And everybody was clicking. But when humility and brokenness and love and the word and the spirit can come in, it could take even a devastating situation like that. Because you know what? Paul started the epistle off by saying, the saints in Corinth. Whew. Paul, are you seeing something that I'm not seeing? I mean, the, these people, the Corinthians, <laughs> those that re were rejecting your apostolic authority, you're talking about those folks, saints? Yes, I am. And that's how I'm going to address them. Because that's who they really are. And when they get a hold of that and they discern that, they'll let that other stuff go. They'll just let that other stuff go. Because, see, their security won't be in who, you know, Apollos or, or Cephas or, or anything like that. Their security won't be in how many gifts that they have and how they're operating in their gift. Their security won't be in that. Their security will be in their relationship with Jesus Christ and their understanding of the body of Christ that they are a part of and that they can pray with and for. And that makes it all good by the grace of God. In Jesus' name. Father, thank you tonight. Bless us to our hearts, and Lord, just <laughs> what we could say about what you can do with a group of people who, in their individuality, they surrender to the corporate reality. They let their gift be used in conjunction with other gifts so that the sum is greater. We come together by faith to reveal your fullness, God. And our goodness doesn't extend to you in the air. Our goodness extends to our brother right here, right now. And so we commit this, Father, to you. We thank you for it. Bless the the break, Lord, those that are traveling, those that will be here, Lord, is fruitful on every side. It's grace on every side. And we are folks who are most thankful that we could even be a part of this, the will and plan of God. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.